coming up this week on the center of it all. We've been hit with cold weather and snow this entire month, but now it's finally starting to slowly warm up and a few rain showers are heading our way. All this means one thing, spring. So we take a look at a winery and how they prepare their delicious drinks. Show you how you can get the best fitting shoe for your outside runs. And Mel shares some easy tips to take your meal from simple to elegant. Don't go anywhere, the center of it all starts right now. Good morning, welcome to the center of it all. We are at the Arboretum at Penn State University enjoying finally being able to get outside despite a few scattered rainstorms, but that's just all part of spring. Now that the weather is finally starting to warm up and you're able to get out of your house, we went to visit a local winery and see what they have to offer and how they get their grapes from the vine to the bottle. The vineyard at Happy Valley Winery is not your typical commercial vineyard. Owner Elwyn Stewart and his wife do all they can to make their vineyard as green as possible. We figure that uh, on an average we generate about uh, 70 to 80 percent of our power needs with this photovoltaic system that's on top of the winery up here. Sustainability is the name of the game. From the compost of all winemaking waste to even the orientation of their vineyard. We compost pretty aggressively and all of the compost, the finished compost, then goes back on the vineyard. So we're using a natural form of fertilizer instead of buying commercial fertilizers. The vineyard itself is kind of sustainable because of its orientation. The rows are pointing approximately north-south. We have strong westerly winds all summer long. That helps dry the vineyard out if we have uh, rain events or heavy dew in the morning. So right away you're using less uh, pesticides to control fungal diseases and uh, in some cases even uh, insects. On this nine acre vineyard there are 15 varieties of grapes that are hand picked in early fall. We, we begin picking here in the middle of September and usually we try to be done by the third week of uh, October if the frost holds off and uh, our final picking of the reds really depends on uh, the frost season. So the longer the frost waits, the longer we allow the reds to hang on the vines because you uh, enhance, you ultimately end up enhancing the quality of the final product, which is the wine by doing that. To get the tasty alcoholic beverage, the raw wine gets pumped from tank to tank, something they call working the wine. So you start off racking the wine off of the, what's called the rough lees, and as you subsequently rack, and that means pumping it off out of one tank into a, a clean tank, and that usually leaves what's called the lees on the bottom. So you pump it over and uh, allow it to set for four to six weeks, and more lees settle to the bottom. You pump it off into another clean tank, and you do that three or four times. And at that point, then, uh, if you're dealing with white wine and it's in stainless steel tanks, you just make sure that it's sealed and protected and uh, let it set. The red wine goes through essentially the same process. At some point, if you're going to go into oak, then you intervene in that process and get it into oak barrels right away. The wine will sit in oak barrels anywhere from 12 to 16 months. From there, the wine is bottled in-house and ready for purchase. Happy Valley Winery has a number of award-winning wines, with some popular ones being the Meritage and Appalachia Red. Their list of over 20 wines has something to please any palate. When we come back, we show you why you may not be getting the best performance out of your running shoes. Welcome back. Did you know that not every single shoe is made to fit every foot? Former Center of It All host Sarah Benick tells us everything you need to know before lacing up that running shoe and hitting the pavement. Terry Loesch has been fitting runners in their shoes for over 30 years. He explained to me that every time you run, you want your feet to be in a neutral motion. The main principle of weight-bearing exercise, whether it's running, basketball, tennis, anything weight-bearing, you want to keep the maximum stress centered on the three largest muscle groups you have, your quads, your hamstring, and your calves. Now, there's only one way to do that you have to be mechanically neutral. There are three different foot structures. Some people do have a normal arch and a mechanically neutral foot. 
Others have a high rigid arch that tends to roll to the outside of the foot. Or you have a low flexible arch that tends to roll to the inside or medial side of the foot. You have to know what your foot structure is and then you have to know the structure of the shoe. So what is your foot structure? Last time I checked, I was a pronation foot structure. So you were moderately over pronating? Yes. Which means that your arch is flexible and it rolls to the medial side, the inside. Uh -huh. So then that would be your foot type, and we need to get you back to there with the right shoe. I moderately pronate when I run. To correct this and bring me back to neutral motion, I need a supportive shoe that will stabilize my foot. You have a Mizuno shoe on. Now I'm going to show you a Mizuno shoe that's made for a really high arched foot and then one that's made for the over pronating low arched foot. Could you tell the difference? Terry threw a challenge my way to see if I could match the right shoe with each foot structure. This is the pronating shoe and this is the supinating shoe. You have it totally wrong. What? <laughs> That's crazy. And now you're going to be crippled. <laughs> Jeez. So after I failed that test, Terry got me up and running to make sure my Mizuno shoes are doing their job of stabilizing my flexible arches. Watching you run, I don't think you have enough four foot cushion and I think it's straining your foot a little when you push through. Aside from foot structure, you also need to look at the initial impact zone to decide where you need more cushion. So do you think a lot of people start out and try to become a runner, they have the wrong shoes and they think, well, it must be my body. It's, it's me. Not I'm me. not I hear it every day. I'm not meant to be a runner. I can't run. My knees hurt every time I do. So I've given up, I'm on the elliptical in whatever shoe it is that they ordered. People are all about brand loyalty, but there's a common misconception that one brand is better than any other. Every company makes the full range from neutral shoes to really, really stiff, supportive shoes. Every company makes them. So is there an Asics running shoe for you? Yes. Is there a Mizuno one? Yes. Are there two Mizunos right here that would not work. Yes. So we have a lot of people that come in and they'll say what you say. Oh, I can't wear this brand. I can't wear anything that Saucony makes because you had the wrong one. So it's not a brand thing. It's a mechanical thing. And who knows more about the mechanics of running than Terry. So stop into Rapid Transit before you start your training regimen and you'll be running more miles with ease. When we come back, Mel shows us that even though a meal may look super complex, it could be very easy to make. Welcome back to the center of it all. Do you ever go to a restaurant, receive your meal, and think, I could never make this? This week, Mel is hoping to change that. When a foodie gets to be my age, we get to take a step back and reflect on how food has changed over the decades. For me, the 1980s and the 1990s were some of my favorite in recent history. New chefs, as well as seasoned chefs, were thinking out of the box. They weren't cooking from them. So fasten your seatbelts and strap your bicycle helmets on, kiddies, because today this grandma is going to show you just how easy cooking an elegant meal from scratch, fit for a king, can be. Let's get started. Oscar was a dish invented for King Oscar of Norway and Sweden back in the 19th century. His chef made him a dish consisting of all of his favorite things, veal, asparagus, crab meat, and hollandaise sauce. The king loved it so much, he named it Veal Oscar. In the 1980s and 1990s, American chefs started preparing the dish, substituting chicken for the veal and bernays for the hollandaise because our American markets were being flooded with boneless, skinless chicken breasts. My favorite way to prepare Oscar is using chicken tenders. They don't call them tender for nothing. They're really juicy, moist, and tender. I've placed eight of them between two sheets of plastic wrap, and I'm gonna use a flat-sided meat mallet, not one of these jagged tooth gadgets, to pound these things to a nice, even, quarter inch thickness. Now in French, to pound means paillard. So what I am doing 
is pyarding chicken breasts. And the end result is I have eight pie yards, which is the noun for thin pieces of meat, seafood, or poultry that are going to cook up really fast in the skillet. And I'm going to remove my top layer of plastic. And I'm going to lightly season all these tops with some flour. I use Wondra. I like granulated flour, but feel free to just use regular all-purpose. And a really nice, nice but um, light seasoning of salt. I'm using sea salt. And the same, a fresh grinding of pepper. And you can use plain black pepper. I like to use a peppercorn blend. Now I'm just going to set these aside for about five minutes to let the flour absorb any excess moisture from the tops of the chicken. And while these are resting, we're going to make blender bernays sauce. If the thought of making hollandaise sauce from scratch strikes fear in your heart, relax. My easy, foolproof blender or food processor method couldn't be easier. I'm going to start by putting three egg yolks in the bottom of a small food processor. I'm adding one tablespoon of lemon juice, an eighth teaspoon of salt, cayenne pepper, and nutmeg. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this noisy little machine on and let it run full power for two full minutes. This is going to take the place of the whisking that we would normally do on top of the double boiler on the stove top. It's going to incorporate air and it's going to start to thicken and warm the egg yolks. And while this machine is running for two minutes, I'm going to pop over the microwave and melt a stick of butter. two minutes and as you can see or I'm going to show you we've got a nice lightly colored lightly thickened egg yolk mixture now the next thing you need to know is the only difference between making hollandaise and making Bernays sauce is to make Bernays sauce you're going to add some shallot and I'm using a tablespoon of finely minced shallot so I'm going to add that right to the mixture and the addition of tarragon so I'm going to add a tablespoon of that to the mixture. Now when I turn this noisy little machine back on, I'm going to start adding the butter in dribs and drabs, not even a thin stream, because if we were whisking on the so stove top, we would have to constantly whisk and add the butter very slowly so that it emulsifies. And this could take up to a minute or two, so let's just start that process right now. took us about a minute and a half, almost two minutes. And what I have, I'm going to remove my little blender blade. Is a cup of some of the most divine blender Bernays sauce you are ever going to taste. I've melted four tablespoons of butter into four tablespoons of olive oil in my electric skillet 
And I love to use my electric skillet for this because I can cook all eight servings or all pie, all eight pie arts at the same time. So I'm just gonna pick up my seasoned pie arts and I'm going to put them in the skillet seasoned side down. And we'll get these sizzling as soon as I get them all into the pan and seasoned. Now I'm going to season the tops, the new tops of these, with another little dose of flour. And a rerun of the sea salt. And the peppercorn blend. Now these are just going to lightly saute. We don't want them really, really golden brown. We just want them beginning to turn brown. That's gonna take about two and a half to three minutes per side. And this is another reason why I really like using the electric skillet because I can control the heat underneath all of these evenly throughout the entire process. These have cooked for about two and a half minutes per side and they're just the way I've described them, really lightly browned starting to brown really nice and tender. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to push all of my pie yards up to one side of the skillet. And when I do that, I'm going to put the traditional ingredients in here. I've got 24 asparagus spears that I steamed. They're fresh. There are people who use frozen asparagus, but we're scratch cooking today. And I'm just gonna add these to the skillet. And I've got a pound of lump crab meat, and I'm going to add that to the skillet. Now I'm not gonna stir these things or make any attempt to disturb the crab meat or anything like that. I'm just gonna put the lid on this and I'm gonna let the chicken rest for three minutes and the asparagus and the crab meat to warm up during the same three minutes. Oscar is a dish that is classically served just warm. It's not served steaming hot. So in three minutes, we're gonna plate this and it's time to eat. This retro meal really is easy, elegant, and fit for a king. More importantly, it's made from scratch using high quality ingredients. If you were in a restaurant, you could expect to dish out $20 to $25 for each one of these servings. At home, I did the math, five to six dollars per serving. That's a small price to pay for such an exquisite feast. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. When we come back, we wrap up our show with a little fish. Welcome back to the center of it all. Whether you've done it before or you're looking to try something new, we have an activity you may want to add to your schedule for these warmer months ahead. The sport, or as some would say, the art of fly fishing is one of the great American hobbies. Perfect for anyone looking for a quiet and serene escape. And for those in central Pennsylvania, we are blessed that we have all the resources needed for experts and beginners alike. Take Dennis Charney, an expert guide and instructor who loves to cast people into the fly fishing waters. I love the opportunity to teach. So nothing thrills me more than to seeing the lights go on and seeing somebody get, you know, uh, some some positive feedback in, in, in their fly fishing or just have a good experience with it. So I, I, I think it's a, 
Fly fishing has a lot of long-standing history, and it's great to be a little teeny part of it at some stage in somebody's life. So I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's, I think it's pretty special. Rewarding for a man who picked up the sport from his grandfather and is just grateful to pass on his knowledge to those looking to join the family. The fly fishing community is a small community of folks. So you, you bump into somebody, you work with somebody, and you may bump into them two years down the road. And it does happen where people are very appreciative and they come back and say, you know, that made all the difference in the world and it made the trip so much more enjoyable. I think any time when we can further our enjoyment in a sport or an activity, it's a good thing. And uh, you do get that with fly fishing and you do get that from your students that come back on a regular basis. Making your first back cast may be intimidating, but so can tying your first sucker spawn as well. You know, first, it's far from rocket science. You know, there's a lot of people who've managed to fly fishing that are no brighter than anyone, uh, any of us. So it, it's not beyond anyone's capabilities. Um, it's not for everyone, but if it, you, know, you get the opportunity to try it, I, I think there's a good reason for you to try it. I think it is a nice, rewarding activity. We do a number of different types of classes throughout the early in the season, and we do one that's a very 101, a very introductory course that just kind of gives you a flavor of all, some of the aspects of fly fishing. You know, and you have more advanced classes that are maybe a little more suited to a guy who's been doing it for a while. But it's everything in between. You know, we do classes that are oriented toward the fly tying. We do classes that are geared toward uh, certain types of fly fishing. You know, it, it really covers the gamut. Still not ready to pick up the sport? Dennis gives us an abridged version of what you're missing. First part of it is with fly fishing, it happens in great places. Whether you're on a local trout stream or you're traveling abroad to go to a, a, a well-known trout stream, within 40 minutes of downtown State College in a nice campus town, you can be in any number of high quality trout streams without having to drive very far. So we have those kind of options real nearby and they are dynamite options. The other part of it is that it's, it's very cerebral. You know, you're, in, you're part of a system you know, you're fishing, but you're thinking all the time. You're thinking about where the fish are, the drift, your fly selection. All of these make you a vital part of the system, which I just think is so much more rewarding and more engaging. Father's Day is a perfect opportunity to pack the car, find a secluded spot, and drift away, all while passing the torch. You know, introducing kids to this, fathers, introducing it to sons, daughters, I think it's I think it's great. I think anytime we can get the kids involved in this, you know, they may not grab a hold of it right away, but you'd like to think that you maybe planted a seed that maybe at some point they want to do it again. And it may happen years down the road. It may happen two weeks down the road. But I think any opportunity we can get to get kids involved and I don't know, expand father son relationships, family relationships on a stream. It's far from a bad thing. That wraps up this week's episode of The Center of It All. Thanks so much for joining me. Hopefully the weather keeps warming up and we can keep getting out and showing you the beautiful Center County community. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.